Ryan, former WTO ambassador during the years 2004 to 2007, a very intense period in the life of WTO and also in the multilateral trade negotiation. As chair of the Aid for Trade Task Force at the time, uh, in personal capacity, I was deeply involved. And since nine years, I'm the CEO of Sweden's leading research-based think tank, SNS, the Center for Business and Policy Studies. We had a very rich day of sessions yesterday and touched on a different aspects connecting to, connected to this session's theme, the multilateral trading system, game over, question mark. The aim of the session is to reflect on what has and what has not been happening at WTO and where things may or should go. We have a prominent group of experts who will provide insights and uh, discuss the issues together with us. Peter Draper, uh, Professor and Executive Director, Institute for International Trade at the University of Adelaide. He will start our session with giving us reflections on the bigger picture, what is driving, what, is see, what we're seeing at and happening at WTO. After that, Peter van der Bosche, Director of Studies at the World Trade Institute uh, and Professor of International Economic Law at the Faculty of Law of the University of Bern, will give us his analysis on the state of play on dispute settlement and his reflection on if and how we can get it back on track. Then Deborah Elms, Executive Director Asian Trade Center in Singapore, will give an overview of the new agenda confronting countries associated with the shift to digital economy and whether and what role WTO could have relative to regional cooperation. And then finally, Bernard Hochman, one of our hosts, Professor and Director Global Economics uh, at the Global Governance Program at the European University Institute, we conclude with remarks on the need and scope for open plurilateral agreements as a path forward. So welcome to you all in the panel. We plan for 10 to 12 minutes interventions that will leave ample time at the end for que questions and answers and also for some ending remarks. We have 90 minutes at our disposal and we will uh, end at 11.30 a.m. But just before we start, a few guidelines for uh, your, participa your participation in the Q&A sessions. First of all, as you have no, probably know, the plenary session is being live streamed. Uh, for those of you who are listening to the event live, please use the YouTube chat function. And for all registered participants, please use the Q&A function of Zoom. And the event hashtag on social media is hashtag World Trade Forum 2020. So with those remarks, uh, please let us start. Peter, I give the floor to you. I assume you're starting with the other Peter. I see that Peter had problems in getting through uh, with his voice. I think he's trying hard. Peter, can you hear us? No, he can't. Um, can I get advice from the experts dealing with our Zoom arrangement? Hi, yes, I will contact him in the chat and maybe you can switch the order of the speakers because he does not have a microphone at all in the event. Okay, we're sorry for this, Peter. Uh, we will hope to have you in soon. And may I then suggest that I leave the floor to our other Peter, Peter, Peter van der Bosche, please. <laughs> Get ready, please go ahead. Thank you, Mia. Um... I will be talking about WTO dispute settlements. Um, and uh, let me share immediately my screen with you. There we go. Um, and look a bit at where we stand today and where we go from here, or where we may go from here. 
Now, um, let's start with some facts and figures. First of all, um, at this very moment, there are 19 consultations ongoing. That's, that's a decent number. Um, but only three of these 19 were initiated in 2020. And that is a historical low. Now, fair enough, the year isn't over yet. Um, but if you compare it with last year, last year there were 19 uh, consultations started. And the year before that, 2018, uh, there were 39. Uh, fair enough, that was a very, very high number, the second highest uh, in the history of this settlement. But um, the fact that only three consultations were started this year uh, is something that um, uh, should make us think. Panel proceedings. There are currently 34 panel proceedings ongoing, and that's a high number. And of these 34, 12 were initiated in 2020, and that's also still a decent number. But then if you look at how many panel reports were circulated in 2020, we come to the fairly shocking number of four, four only. And again, if you compare that with the number of panel reports circulated um, last year, 14, or in 2018, 16, you wonder what's happening. Now, perhaps this is COVID, and there will be a number of panel reports circulated uh, in the three months still left uh, in this year. The ballot review. Uh, currently, 13 appeals pending before a now paralyzed appellate body. Of these 13, 10 um, are um, appeals that the appellate body was not allowed to complete. And three of the 13 have been appeals uh, in the void. Appeals into the void. Um, first of all, we had already on the 18th of December, so a few days after it had paralyzed um, the appellate body, um, the United States appealed US carbon steel 21.5 into the void. In July, of this year, Saudi Arabia did the same with um, an unfavorable um, panel report, unfavorable to Saudi Arabia, in Saudi Arabia protection of IPRs. And earlier this month, uh, the EU appealed the cost adjustment methodologies um, report uh, into the board. Now, in all likelihood, and I would love somebody in the audience to contradict me on this, but in all likelihood, there are two more reports which have been recently circulated. The Softwood Lumber Settlement Report uh, circulated in August, and the Tariff Measures on Certain Goods from China report circulated um, a few days ago. These two reports are most likely to be appealed into the void by the United States. So, where does that bring us? As things stand now, all panel reports since the paralysis of the appellate body on the 11th of December last year, all panel reports have been or are likely to be appealed into the void. Therefore, we are de facto back to a GATT dispute settlement system where the losing party can and does block the adoption of panel reports. The paralysis of the appellate body obviously has continued in 2020. Um, this is in spite of repeated requests, monthly requests, by 120 plus members to unblock the appointment process. 
and there will be a similar request um, at the DSB meeting of next week. What we have seen in February 2020 is the publication of the USDR report on the functioning of the appellate body. A list, a helpful list, um, of all the things that the United States considered the appellate body has done wrong. In April, we've heard, and I've never heard him say it so clearly, it was actually in a, an opinion piece in the Wall Street Journal. Ambassador Lighthizer said that what he wanted, how he saw the, the future of dispute settlement in the WTO, he saw it as a single stage, commercial arbitration like adjudication with rulings only applicable to the parties to the dispute. I don't think that in 2020 we have seen any progress whatsoever on appellate body reform or more broadly on dispute settlement reform. What we have of course seen is the multi-party interim appeal arbitration arrangement, the MPIA. Entered into force on the 30th of April 2020. And the arrangement now has 23 parties. I was very happy to see the list of 10 MPIA arbitrators, um, a list that was made public uh, on the 31st of July 2020. This is a group of very, very credible. Um, arbitrators. It remains to be seen how quickly <laughs> they will get to work. Um, it's not clear when they will have their first case, neither is it clear which these cases will be or which this case will be. It may be Canada sale uh, of wine, dispute between Canada and Australia. It may be Costa Rica, avocados from Mexico. And it may even be Canada commercial aircraft, um, although that um, panel um, is currently suspended and um, that until um, November 2020, the latest. But it's not clear um, when they will um, have their first appeal to, to deal with. But what I was personally quite um, enthusiastic um, when um, I saw the MPIA first, I've become less enthusiastic um, and more worried. I think there's trouble ahead. And there's trouble ahead in the first place because of um, the fact that some parties, some MPIA parties, seem to have second thoughts about Collegiality. Collegiality among uh, the group of arbitrators. Um, and with that, in particular, I mean um, ex having an exchange of views uh, uh, between all then arbitrators on every uh, appeal. That's explicitly provided for uh, in uh, the arrangement, paragraph five. Uh, it's also uh, referred to explicitly in paragraph eight uh, of the standard degree procedures. But I fear from what I heard in the corridors, and these days I don't hear anything more, I, I, I fear that um, uh, they're going for someone to go for a very minimalistic interpretation, um, application um, of uh, these collegiality uh, requirements. And that would make um, the MPIA proceedings uh, much more like international arbitration and much less like um, what the appellate body has been doing. So, looking at the future. Um, let me start by saying that I agree with um, um, what, uh, among others, uh, Bernard and Petros um, have emphasized. 
namely that the core feature of WTO dispute settlement that has to be preserved at all costs is uh, the negative consensus adoption of reports. Um, but I immediately note that, as I said before, that this feature is currently no longer present as a result of um, the appeals into the void. Having said that, um, I see three possible ways out of the current crisis. Actually, I see four possible ways, but the fourth is uh, my conclusion. Um, let me first talk about these possible ways. First of all, it's the revival of the appellate body as we have known it for 25 years. And you will not be surprised to hear from me uh, that I think that the appellate body served the system well. That, that does not mean that you can make mistakes, um, but I think it served the system very well. Um, so to revive uh, the appellate body. Uh, that appellate body, that revived appellate body will be a reformed appellate body. I think one has to learn from one's mistake. Now, reform how? Well, a starting point um, might be uh, to reform it uh, along the Walker principles of October 2019. Um, Walker principles um, that, um, been, that had broad, broad support uh, among the membership, but clearly uh, were not acceptable or that sort of reform uh, was not acceptable, did not go far enough uh, for the United States and perhaps also for some other uh, WTO members. There is, however, another problem that I see with huh, getting out of this crisis by merely reviving the appellate body. Well, drop the word merely, by, by reviving the appellate body. And that is that I think um, that would leave the problems at the, at the panel stage uh, unaddressed. And um, the current crisis um, focuses on the appellate body, um, but there are at least as many problems at the panel stage which need to be addressed. So, so one possible way out of the crisis is to revive the IB, IB the AB. Um, another possible way is to allow the MPIA um, to replace appellate review under Article 17 the issue. Uh, Currently, the MPIA has, as I already mentioned, 23 uh, parties. Um, and now we count the EU 27 as one. Um, and uh, these 23 uh, uh, comprise at least half of the, the frequent users of the system. Um, but obviously, um, in order for this to be a way out of the crisis, uh, many more uh, members would have to join. And um, not quite clear uh, whether that will happen. Now, um, I also question, and that is related to uh, the trouble ahead that I already referred to uh, with regard to the MPIA uh, before. And actually, when I do this refer to the trouble ahead, I think I, 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 I failed to mention something that all of you are already uh, familiar with in terms of trouble ahead. Um, namely, that the United States has made it very, very clear that they do not want to have any money or any staff um, of the WTO um, uh, being spent uh, on or working for um, the MPIA. But back to uh, the other trouble ahead that I saw, namely um, the lack of collegiality among the uh, then uh, um, arbitrators. I, I, it remains to be seen whether the MPIA will provide effective appellate review as we need it. Again, um, just allowing the MPIA to replace appellate review would uh, not solve the problems at the panel stage. So, this brings me to the third possible way out of the crisis. And that is to replace uh, the current two-stage, well, not current, huh, but the traditional uh, two-stage uh, dispute settlement uh, system of the WTO uh, with uh, a one-stage uh, dispute settlement system, um, as uh, uh, proposed uh, by 
uh, Bernard and Petros. Um, I've, I've looked at uh, the proposals they made uh, with, with, with great care and, 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 and admiration. Um, uh, they propose, uh, I suppose we're all familiar with it, but let me um, highlight what I think is very important. They propose um, the establishment of a permanent panel body of 12 to 15 full-time adjudicators that would serve uh, for a term uh, of uh, eight years. Now, without any doubt, uh, the reports that would be produced by these um, full-time adjudicators um, would be of high, very high quality. The question that I have, though, is whether that would, um, would mean that there would be no need anymore, or no useful function served anymore um, by appellate review. Uh, it is often argued, um, and it has been argued by pe like people by my, like myself, you know, that you need appellate review in order to, um, to guarantee the consistency of the case law uh, and thus have a dispute settlement system that contributes to the security and predictability of the multilateral trading system. We all know this. Yeah? Um, so the argument is you need appellate review for the consistency of the case law. But reflecting on... Um, this proposal regarding a, 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 a permanent panel body, which, by the way, is uh, not original, original because uh, the European Union so many years ago uh, um, already made a similar proposal uh, that, um, that at the time um, got very, very little support. But the proposal here. Um, and now um, provides for uh, certain cases to be heard in plenum. And if that happens, and in addition, there is a practice, uh, practice to which uh, Bernard and, 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 and Petros do not refer, but I hope that that would also be part of it. There's a practice of having an exchange of views on all other cases. Those that do not go to plenum you have at least an exchange of views. And such a thing would be possible if you have a body that is limited to 12 to 15 um, uh, adjudicators. If you have that, I think um, such a permanent um, panel body could ensure consistency in the case law. But that doesn't mean that there is no argument for the penalty review. Um, I would argue that uh, the key issues raised in, and I put between brackets, many, this one may dispute this, but, but I would like to say many. The key issues raised in many disputes are too important to be decided in a one-stage system. Uh, in my Peter, mind, yes, Peter, um, may I remind you uh, of that you have one or two minutes left? Yes, and I'm, I'm about to conclude. You. Um, uh, in my nine years on the appellate body, um, if there's one thing that I've noted is that on appeal, part, parties make better, more focused legal arguments. I would also argue um, that appellate review um, increases the legitimacy of, of dispute settlement outcomes. What I would like to put on the table is whether parties should have the right to appeal in all cases or whether there should be some selection process as to which cases uh, should go or should be allowed uh, to be appealed. Coming back to the last uh, way out that I, I discussed, the way out of the crisis and single stage WTO dispute settlement as a solution for, to the current crisis. Let us just reflect on the following question. Would unfavorable reports of the permanent panel body, regardless of their high quality, and I'm sure they would be of high quality, be more acceptable to the United States and others than unfavorable appellate body reports? To conclude, I would like to see a fourth way out, and perhaps I'm a dreamer. Um, no, not perhaps, I am a dreamer. Um, the fourth way out of this crisis uh, would be to revive 
a reformed appellate body and to establish a permanent panel body, perhaps a larger than um, Bernard and Petros have in mind, um, but, uh, and I think with such a system, uh, we would serve um, the international trading community best. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that overview of the state of play and also how to get back on track. There is one question. I think we should take it here now because it's very much connected to your presentation. Um, uh, I'm, I'm reading it out. Um, it's from Dr. Pinar Artiran. Uh, and he says, uh, you did not seem to cite the EU appeal on the panel report on EU cost adjustment methodologies and certain anti-dumping measures on imports from Russia. Second complaint, DS-494, among your appeals into the void. How would you qualify that appeal by the EU in the past weeks? Thank you. Okay. That is a question. Um, I, I think it's, it's on the list um, of the uh, five reports that I referred to. Um, so uh, I'm, uh, I'm happy to engage with the person that asked the question um, uh, offline, um, but uh, I think it's in the it is in the list. So okay. I, and that's wise. Thank you. Now I see that Peter Draper is on board, and uh, so let us then go back to uh, your turn and uh, get this overview of what's happening and not happening in WTO. Please, Peter, the floor is yours. Thanks, Mayor, and sorry for the technical glitches earlier. I've also got a presentation to share, um, just six slides, so hopefully fairly brief. Um, all right, so I'm going to talk about the prospects for global trade cooperation focus on the WTO uh, after the pandemic, although we're right in the midst of the pandemic still, but at some point presumably it will uh, be a thing of the past, at least we hope it will be a thing of the past. So the presentation in three parts. Um, the first is um, the breakdown of global trade cooperation as I see it prior to the onset of COVID-19. I think it's important to start there because the WTO faced in essence a growing systemic crisis before the pandemic and that hasn't gone away. If anything, it's intensified. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about how the pandemic has um, has uh, interpolated with those pre-existing trends and in some ways um, hastened the onset of an economic disintegration trend that is quite alarming, I think, that we all see in, in the trade community. And then end up with some uh, implications for WTO reforms, um, which will have a measure of optimism in there, but I have to say up front, I'm not particularly optimistic uh, right now about the prospects for success. And I'm sure we'll pick that up in, in the conversation. So first of all, um, uh, and apologies if this looks a little bit like a school of fish swimming at you, but this is the best I could do with my mind mapping software. So. On the top part of this diagram, uh, what I've tried to show is the clustering of disintegration forces versus on the bottom part, um, integration forces, which is not to imply that one set is necessarily greater than the other. But I do think that these four forces uh, above, the disintegration forces are gathering pace on a number of tracks and that this process has actually been in train for some time. Um, so uh, going to the bullets on the right hand side, what we have seen is the relative rise of the rest, uh, I think particularly of the BRICS, although no one sort of talks about them much these days as a construct. Um, the growth of populism, which we all know about and many of us are tracking, especially in the West, but not only in the West, the stalling of reforms in uh, China, particularly and the reversal now, I would argue, of those reform processes in China. And that um, is resulting uh, in 
this outright hostility and contestation between the United States in particular, as represented by Donald Trump and the election of Donald Trump and China, which is increasingly a contest of um, organizational models or even philosophies of design and society, if you want to take it that far. And hence we've entered into the era of geopolitical contest, very sharp geopolitical contest, trade wars, technology wars, name them what you will, the investment wars, all of them come, I think, as, as a package. We all know this, we're all worried about this. Um, and hence we have now an openly geopolitical EU commission. Um, but these tensions are not just confined um, to the US, China, and the EU. We're also seeing them breaking out even in uh, armed hostilities to some extent, although arms haven't actually been produced yet, but on the China-India border, and certainly in our part of the world in the Asia Pacific, I think we're all very alarmed about the rapid increase of tensions around the East China Sea, the South China Sea, etc., and the kinds of ramifications that's having in terms of um, bilateral tensions, particularly with China at the center and trade being sucked into that. And the argument I'm making is that much of that can be linked to those forces of, of disintegration. So just some very quick highlights there, the reassertion of sovereignty, um, the politics of exclusion, the reassertion of nationalism uh, in, in a range of countries, the refocusing on security in many countries around the world and what we're certainly seeing in the Asia Pacific is a rearming process that's going on that's actually quite alarming and all of that framed in terms of, of geopolitics. Um, but on the other hand the forces of integration haven't gone away and this is where we need to put some optimism. Um, so these cross-border value chains are still very much an operation. There's many, many of them, of course, and they're powerful integrative forces. Um, the cluster of technologies that we could call the fourth industrial revolution continues to grow rapidly uh, and in many ways are an integrated set of, of uh, technologies, although the policies around them are increasingly contested, particularly thinking of digital flows and digital trade governance. Uh, and finance, of course, remains very much the global industry sine qua non. But what we're also seeing is a re-emphasis in some ways of regionalism, which is a subset, I guess, of global uh, integration. Uh, consumers certainly still want to, to consume a whole range of relatively cheaply produced goods, uh, freely available. These kinds of forces have not gone away. Uh, but what I'm arguing is that the pendulum has been shifting towards the disintegrative forces and that, that that was in place before COVID-19. Now, what has COVID-19 brought? Um, so firstly, what we have seen in pre pretty much every country around the world is that the human impulse to protect one's own has resulted in a whole range of trade measures that have been quite uh, destructive of the trading system. But first and foremost, very severe and very sharp trade interruptions or, or disruptions. And I think we've all seen this chart that the WTO Secretariat produced recently. This is taken from the Goods Trade Barometer. And so that very precipitous decline in international trade flows is, is without historical precedent, so far as I can tell, the speed and the depth of, of that decline. Um, but of course, mostly governments have been responding to the the health uh, dimensions of the pandemic, with many imposing export restrictions, as we know, the work of the Global Trade Alert and others has really uh, highlighted this. There have been some liberalizing measures, which is good, particularly countries that don't have good access to, to medicines. But what we've also seen going on is the process of enormous uh, financial transfers, uh, massive subsidies of entire corporate sector led uh, by central banks particularly, but also finance ministries. And so quite what is a market economy and what is not, not a market economy in this context, I think is an increasingly challenging question to grapple with. And more importantly, what happens once the pandemic has passed? 
but these subsidies are still in the system and the, there's a whole new set of interests built around this that will want to retain those subsidies. And we all know, of course, that one of the big issues on the WTO reform agenda is industrial subsidies reform. So this has just got a whole lot more complicated because of the, the pandemic. What we've also seen happening is that the responses to the pandemic and the politics of those responses has led to an intensification of geopolitical competition. So for instance, the Australian call for a UN or a World Health Organization investigation into the causes of COVID-19 induced uh, predictable but very negative re response in China. What we've seen in the wake of that is an escalation of trade tensions between China and Australia. And that's just one example. So that geopolitical competition is really sharpened in the wake of, of the pandemic. And some of that plays out in terms of the supply chain resilience debate. Uh, some might say robustness, others might say resilience. I don't want to dwell on the terms. Uh, but basically, it's not just a health-related matter in, anymore. It also has military dimensions. It has food security dimensions. So the pandemic then has intensified pre-existing debates about resilience and about reshoring uh, supply chains. So a very complicated picture in, in short. Um, now bringing this to the WTO, I would suggest uh, that before COVID-19, uh, WTO reform was baffling in, in many ways, how to proceed. Um, we all have a sense of what the agenda issues are, but how to get progress in this increasingly sharply contested geopolitical environment is the real question. Um, and we know that, that prior to COVID-19, the forging of multilateral accords, the negotiations function of the WTO had effectively stalled. We still don't have an agreement on fisheries subsidies to take the most obvious example. Last great success was the trade facilitation agreement. There certainly is a model for other things, but there's not been much since beyond the joint statement initiatives. And those are positive. Um, this is a plurilateral technology that I think many of us would certainly embrace, and I certainly support that approach. I think that is the way to proceed uh, with the negotiations function of the WTO. But so far, there's not much to show uh, for all those uh, joint statement negotiations. Maybe that will change in the future, but I think the extent to which particularly the joint statement initiative on e-confidence gets into cross-border data flow issues and data governance, it's going to, going to get very difficult to, to get concrete progress because of the geopolitics and the different philosophies in the three major regulatory zones, China, the EU, and, and the US. But nonetheless, I, I would argue that um, the reform debates, at least the core reform issues, center on th three things. Uh, so the first the ve vexed issue, a continually vexed issue, is how to reform special and differential treatment for developing countries and precisely who is a developing country and who should be able to claim this status? How should China, for instance, be treated in this context? Historically, we know, of course, it's always been a self-designation approach that, that has its merits, but should there be explicit discussion of some kind of graduation criteria as the US has, has advocated? Part, part of me is quite sympathetic to that notion. Uh, but of course, it's politically very difficult to do in the WTO context for all the reasons I think we know very well. Uh, but nonetheless, something has to be done, I think, in the special and differential treatment space if the WTO is to proceed uh, on, a, on a sensible track and, and retain its relevance. The second big issue, which I've touched on already, is how to accommodate uh, various forms of state capitalism, so not just Chinese state capitalism. Uh, as I mentioned in the post-COVID environment, I'm not quite sure anymore who's state capitalist and who is not, or who's a market economy and, and who is not for that matter. Uh, but still, this issue of industrial subsidies particularly is particularly challenging. I would argue actually that the reform process needs to be incubated outside of the WTO initially, and particularly in the G20, 
If you could get agreement in the G20, that would help a lot, but that's not an easy proposition either. Um, and then the third issue, again, not a new one, is decision-making modalities, multilateral versus plurilateral. So clearly on some issues, the WTO does need to make multilateral progress. Fishing subsidies is the obvious case in point, but uh, the joint statement initiatives have showed us there also needs to be a renewed emphasis on plurilaterals, coalitions of the willing, et cetera. But a whole range of questions within that as to how to make these plurilaterals work in ways that are relatively inclusive and so that the system can, can advance and forge new rules in the process, which is a particularly difficult issue to do. So the members are sharply divided. We know this progress is deeply challenging. It's becoming more challenging all the time. Uh, we have a US presidential election coming up um, and that has differential implications perhaps for how all this plays out, but it's still a very, very um, consequential election for the WTO, I would argue. And then finally, how could we harness some of the COVID-19, uh, I don't want to say momentum, but I can't think of a better word, to the WTO reform dynamic? So I think there's several things that should be done. Uh, getting them done is a politically challenging manner, but let's table them anyway. Uh, so firstly is the idea of, of um, a plurilateral to reduce or further reduce import duties on critical health equipment, pharmaceuticals uh, and related inputs, et cetera. This is being discussed in the Otto group, uh, as we know, and, and beyond the EU's table proposals along these lines. And I think that that should be an important conversation to, to progress. This would have to obviously be done on an MFN uh, basis, uh, given that it involves input duty reductions. I think what could also potentially be usefully done in the WTO is to clarify what essential goods and services actually means. And I deliberately include services here because much of the impact of or the economic impact of COVID-19 has been felt in the services sector and, and in a range of essential services. So air transport comes to mind, for example, or just the movement of people, technicians, uh, workers, et cetera, across borders. Um, so how, how could governments invoke um, restrictions to essential services in the future? That could be a a useful conversation that that could be clarified. And then of course, I've already spoken about this to, to contain, manage and roll back the subsidization of domestic firms through the many rescue packages that national governments have implemented. So this is something that the G20 has rhetorically agreed to. How to give effect to it is, is the central challenge. And I think, again, the G20 is an important group in this context because that's in many ways brings together the core players, if they can't get to some kind of understandings and agreement, it's not obvious that the rest of the membership can. But I also think on the multilateral front, there are some key things that could and should be done. And these are not easy by any means, but still. Uh, the first is to clarify the conditions under which GATS exceptions clauses could be accessed. And I think particularly of export restrictions. And not only export restrictions related to medicines, there's a whole range of other export restrictions that are, have moved into the frame and are moving into the frame. So for instance, thinking of the military terrain, uh, dual use information technologies, critical minerals, all of these uh, have, have important roles to play in this new geopolitical environment that we're in. Uh, but of course, food security as well, as we saw in 2008, when many countries resorted to the use of export restrictions uh, to mistakenly uh, to resolve their, their food price crises. And then, of course, to clarify the national security exceptions. Now, that's a really challenging issue, but um, it's become a mercantilist tool, as we, we know. Um, so to have a meaningful national security exception, there do need to be sharper definitions of what that means. Getting to agreement on this definitely won't be easy. That doesn't make it uh, an unimportant exercise. Uh, and then finally on special and differential treatment, I would put my story on a little bit on having more transparency in the process. Um, 
as well as looking at establishing objective graduation criteria. And I think this could be something that the academic community particularly might take on. Uh, how would you establish objective graduation criteria? What do we mean by development? Uh, we, can we say a country is developed or not? These are all the kinds of questions that come to mind. I think the problem is if a multilateral institution, say the World Bank, were to do this, it would would automatically be wrapped up in ideological baggage. Uh, but still, organizations like that have a lot to contribute to uh, technical capacity, et cetera, in this space as well. It's very important if we're talking about reforming a special and differential treatment, we also have to link that to the provision of, of aid for trade. So for instance, if we're going to set up a set of graduation criteria, how can you link aid for trade to those different levels of, of graduation? But at the end of the day, I suspect the way special and differential treatment will continue to work will be through uh, plurilateral negotiations and coming to practical accords on a negotiation by negotiation basis. The reason I think, frankly, we have to look at the graduation criteria is because the US is pushing hard in this direction and I don't see that going away. Uh, so that at least we can have a meaningful look at it if only to dismiss it, if that's the result, we should make the efforts in, in my view. And I'll stop there, Chair. Thank you very much for this overview, Peter. I will take one question directly before I give the floor to Deborah. And that's a question, short question from Said Akman, who asks what specific role the G20 can undertake to facilitate WTO reform? It's not a, it's not a small question and you have alluded to it already a bit. Would you like to add something? Well, if one thinks of the G20 as a kind of self-appointed global steering group, then firstly, it needs to take WTO reform seriously. Um, that is a discussion that trade ministers would have to lead and it's already embedded in the G20 process as, as we know. Um, actually getting agreement amongst the trade ministers on trade issues is a highly challenging uh, process. That, that is the issue. So, um, you know, we, we've looked at this in the context of very specific reform issues. So under the, the Saudi Think 20 process, uh, a couple of us, including Saeed, put forward a series of policy briefs. The one that I was involved in leading was on industrial subsidies reform where we looked very specifically of, at what is the role of the G20 and how could the G20 organize a discussion around uh, industrial subsidy reform. And I think it's got to get to that level in the G20 where it's going beyond generalities into what actually needs to be reformed and then setting up processes around that, which could be devolving it to, in the case of industrial subsidies reform, I would say meetings of finance officials, because this is all about money at the end of the day, as well as trade officials. And I certainly wouldn't just leave it to the trade officials because they, they're just going to probably reproduce the Geneva blockages. Um, so I think it needs to go beyond just the trade community. Thank you very much, Peter. So now, Deborah, uh, you have the floor. Welcome. Thank you very much. So gentlemen, we said that we would A, have no slides and B, be brief. And we don't seem to be following that particularly well. So let me see what I can do. I have no slides and I intend to be brief. Um, the, the title of this particular panel is, is multilateralism dead or is the WTO dead? One of the two. Um, and I think part of the reason why my fellow panelists have gone with slides and have gone on longer than anticipated is that this is a not as easy a question as you would like. Or if it is an easy question, no one wants to say the answer, which is yes, it's dead. And it's dead for a whole variety of reasons. It's a sort of death by a thousand paper cuts and a few sword you know, slices. Um, and, and every part of the WTO functions are currently in crisis, or at least are not functioning as intended. So then faced with this challenge, particularly people who care deeply about the multilateral trading system, which I assume is both panelists and most of the people who are listening to this uh, on either the, the Zoom call itself or on YouTube are not 
particularly satisfied with that answer. You don't want to hear about an institution to which you have devoted a big part of your life, your effort, your passion, and your enthusiasm is not doing well. So you end up with very long conversations about how do we fix this. Um, and I think that is the real challenge that we have on this panel is to come up with something that is shorter, probably impossible to deal with so many challenges, dysfunctions, et cetera, on top of which we have all kinds of new out external pressures that are creating tensions, challenges, and additional problems for the future. Uh, as was just mentioned, for example, all of the various export subsidies or other subsidy programs domestically for COVID sets us up for future challenges. So if we didn't have enough on our plate, uh, for a variety of reasons, we throw in a pandemic, we throw in government responses to a pandemic, we have a dysfunctional system, and then there we are. So, you know, it's not a great picture, I have to say. And I am sadly not going to add a whole lot of happiness to the scenario because I was asked to talk specifically about digital trade uh, and about alternative pathways to get solutions if the WTO system is, if we're not going to call it dead, at least in a moribund state at the moment. So the problem with the digital trade is this. We have, um, as Peter just mentioned, ongoing negotiations at the WTO or alongside the WTO in the JSI Joint Sector Initiative between a fairly substantial number of countries now who are trying to deal with the digital trade questions. If you talk to the business community and actually consumers or anyone, frankly, they would say, what is the most important part of trade going forward digital? It's digital, it's all day, it's every day, it's digital trade. How do you get online? How do you buy things online? How do you sell online? Not just goods, but also services. This is the space in which everyone is already occupying and prepared to be much more urgent and much more important in trade in the future. And so if you say, well, given the importance of digital trade, what is the status of the JSI talks in the WTO? The answer is not great for a variety of reasons. One, of course, digital doesn't know boundaries. So digital doesn't understand uh, why only some portion of WTO members are part of this initiative and not all. I think that's a particular challenge because at the end of the day, let's imagine, sake of, sake of argument, the JSI countries come up with something fabulous, okay? It doesn't apply to the whole world. So what happens to countries that are not included? What happens to firms that are trying to move digital, whether it's data, whether it's goods, whether it's services, whatever it is, digitally delivered something or other, across JSI members, non-JSI members. This could be tricky. Now, there are ways to solve this, and I'm sure we could have another very long PowerPoint to explain some of the options. Uh, but the point is, it's more tricky than it needs to be. So digital is a challenge. We have a very wide agenda or an increasingly wide agenda in the JSI talks, because as you start to unpack what is digital trade today and what is digital trade likely to look like tomorrow, you discover very quickly that there is a wide range of things you have to address. Everything from policies around data, data flows, data information, data localization, data hosting, classification potentially of data, which if you're not going to allow some data to flow freely between borders, which data is that? All data, some data, medical data, but not financial data, financial data, but not health data, personal data, but not so much. I mean, it gets very complicated very quickly. That's just data. Then we have movement of services, digitally delivered services, also challenging. We're trying to adapt and shoehorn existing WTO rules to fit that. It doesn't work very well. The flow of goods, exponential service, exponential uh, flows of new e-commerce packages, overwhelming commerce department, uh, uh, sorry, customs departments in many places challenging. How do we deal with that? What are some trade facilitation issues related to digital? Then there's a whole nother bucket of things in the digital trade space that are, for example, related to the IP protections. So we don't have a lot in the WTO setting of digitally uh, focused IP protections. So, you know, the more you get into digital trade and the more you think about it, not just today, but especially tomorrow, where we have an internet of things and we have people who are increasingly connected by digital devices every minute of every day globally, how do we handle that kind of future? How do we get permission, consent, et cetera? How do we deal with the data flows? How do we deal with movement of different kinds of information? All sorts of permutations come up, very difficult, which is why the JSI agenda has expanded. Now the challenge is how do you get 
to some kind of solution with a wide and diverse group of countries. These are even countries that volunteered to be there. So the ones who are presumably particularly unre unready or unwilling or unable to engage in the JSI conversations haven't joined. So this is a bit of a coalition of the willing at this point. If a coalition of the willing is struggling to get to an outcome, what can you do? Well, one solution is to say, let's default and go to smaller groups. Let's just keep building things together from the ground up, smaller groups that come together. But there, and this is where uh, you, know, you get a bit depressed, frankly, you say, well, how have smaller groups done at developing especially digital rules? And the answer coming out of Asia, at least, is marginally well. So in some respects, Asian economies have done a good job dealing with what they call e-commerce on the trade side, but it's really broader than that, uh, dating back some period of time. So if we look at, for example, an ASEAN, Australia, New Zealand agreement, uh, ANSFITA, which was launched in 2010. So this is a relatively early uh, effort at digital in the region, pretty comprehensive agreement that's now being upgraded. There's the potential to have some more interesting things in there, but that was challenging to get done and it's challenging to implement. So you expand on that. You say, well, okay, now ASEAN on its own has to come up with some kind of digital agenda. It's been grappling with this for a couple of years now. This is the year in which ASEAN, the 10 members of Southeast Asian nations were supposed to have the digital, digital governance framework in place. COVID of course disrupts that a bit, but partly it's disrupted because the 10 members of ASEAN are very diverse and they don't all have quite the same ideas about what should be included, what should be excluded, difficult. If you go slightly larger, you say, well, we have RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, 15 countries negotiating that, ready to sign, fingers crossed, in November. Um, there are data, they have had data uh, and digital issues on the agenda from the beginning. But even there, been difficult. So you have 15 countries, that's all 10 members of ASEAN, China, Japan, Korea, Australia, and New Zealand. India was part of the negotiations, will not be signing in November for a variety of reasons. Even in that space, some of the critical digital issues have proved to be impossible to solve. So we are not gonna have anything in RCEP on data flows. We're not gonna have anything in RCEP on data hosting or data localization. And we're not gonna have anything in RCEP that extends the moratorium on customs duties uh, uh, outside of the WTO itself. So the big three on the digital trade side, unable to be done among 15 countries who said they were committed to this. So if you can't get 15 countries, and this I'm just gonna come wrap around before we run out of time here. If you can't get 15 countries together who are at the leading edge, most of them uh, in the digital space, and, and those of you who don't follow Asia might not be aware of this, but even our least developed countries in Asia are remarkably cutting edge. The mobile applications are crazy. The amount of e-commerce delivery and so forth that we see in Cambodia, Lao, or Myanmar is through the roof. The number of platforms that we have, the opportunities for small firms to be online. This is a digitally connected part of the world. And if this 15 countries in this digitally connected part of the world cannot get their act together to create high quality digital outcomes, it's even more depressing when you turn back and you think about what is the multilateral global trade system going to do on this where we have fundamental different differences of opinion between key players. Uh, and, and if you think about where you go for here, you know, you need digital rules. I mean, I was, I had to, we've been writing endless papers on the digital trade space. Uh, you know, the WTO came into to being in 1995, just to remind you when that was, the World Wide Web which was the forerunner, those of you who are young may not even know this, but the forerunner to the internet actually started in 1995 when we finally moved from what was at the time a very uh, government focused connection between government laboratories to become a commercial operation. So that's how long it has been since we had rules at the WTO, the entire digital economy, everything that you probably do most of your day was not part of the original WTO and has not been added since then. So if you wanna talk about how to make the WTO relevant, it has to address digital trade, but getting to address digital trade in the WTO is gonna prove almost impossible. So the sad problem is that at the end of all of this, you come back to the, is the WTO dead? Again, no one wants to pronounce the death, but it is very difficult to imagine how an institution is going to continue to stay relevant when so much of the global economy is unlikely to be addressed in addition to all of the other challenges that my colleagues have, have pointed out. So 
let me stop there. Um, and I'm happy to discuss things further in the Q&A. Thanks. Thank you, Deborah, and thank you for doing it so quickly and so rich. I do have a question to you uh, that came up and which relate to your final remark. And maybe you, we could save uh, you know, the longer discussion afterwards, but just a quick word from you. The question is from Hildegun Chivik Nordos, and it's for you. What should be the scope of the e-commerce agreement, uh, e.g. rules of principles, uh, question mark? And how do you think division of labor between WTO, ITO, WIPO, and other international organizations should be? It's a very big question. Just a quick it is remark. A big question. So I think the challenge is that if you're in one of these IOs, then you say, of course, we should be involved. And of course, this issue of digital trade affects us. And of course, we should all get together. But the, you can see the problem. The more you get in to address these issues, the harder it is to get to an outcome of, all, of any kind. So while it's true that digital has implications for lots of other organizations like WIPO, because I mentioned the WTO challenges and digital challenges around copyright, for example, if we're all cutting and pasting snippets from the internet, then what's going on with copyright? Um, you know, so the, the challenge here is how do we update rules? How do we create new rules? And the bigger the coalition of, of institutions and governments that are involved in that, the harder it will be to get an answer. So the, the, the challenge is yes, a lot of people should be involved and they may be able to be providing helpful feedback, but the more you make this bigger, the harder, I mean, it's already big enough. How do you make it to get to an outcome when you start adding in additional institutions and agencies? So I would be a bit cautious at the moment of trying to add additional IOs when we can't even get the WTO coalition of the willing, so to speak, to get any real traction going on some of the toughest issues in the JSI talks. Thank you, Deborah. Now I give the floor to Bernard uh, to, to end the panelist sessions, part of the session. Okay, great, thanks. Um, I, will, I will accompany Deborah and not use slides. I think that also will help keep things um, on time so that we can have more time to discuss. So what I want to talk about is kind of reflect a bit and maybe be a bit more positive than, than Deborah has been in terms of prospects <coughs> and kind of address this question of is it game over? I think it's important to kind of reflect back on the way this institution, the organization, the trading system has evolved over time, right? So one of the things I would start by saying is that, yes, we are in a very challenging time right now. But at the same time, we've been in very challenging times before, right? And these things take time to address. So if you think, if you go back to the 1980s, we had the multi-fiber agreement, we had voluntary export restraints everywhere, steel, footwear. We had the EU common agricultural policy, a huge source of global uh, distortions of markets. And we had the US doing the aggressive unilateralism they're doing today. Uh, perhaps a bit more diplomatically than the Trump administration. But again, that instrument was there, it was used. And the upshot of all of that uh, activity, noise, kind of, uh, you know, bad policies was eventually that people got together and, and negotiated the way around. Now, people will say today, no, we're in a different situation because China is unique. State capitalism is a fundamental existential threat to the trading system. And I would also kind of take issue with that. Um, I think there are going to be incentives for China to actually think through and to develop rules of the game in different areas. Again, that's going to take time. It's going to be difficult. But I would stress that the adjustment pressures we're seeing today, which really are part and parcel of the backlash against the WTO globalization, are inevitable. Right, so we've seen this readjustment of the world economy towards the emerging economies. China, of course, is the big player, but just think about what happens when India really starts getting its act together. And we think 20, 30, 40 years ahead of time, we have another 1.x billion people who are very actively engaged in, in the world economy. So adjustment pressures are going to be with us. And I think it's very much part of the problem here is we need to focus on national policies that are needed to address uh, to address these issues. Deborah mentioned digital. So clearly the technological changes that are ongoing today and that we can already see happening very fast and much faster as a result of COVID and working from home 
are going to be an even bigger order of magnitude challenge for uh, global governance. Right? And I think, therefore, it's almost inevitable that the governments are going to have to deal with these issues. And the question is where? What we're seeing today uh, in not just the United States, uh, we're seeing that also we see tendencies in this direction in Europe, calls for strategic autonomy, for reshoring of supply chains, essentially protectionist measures which are often clothed in environmental kind of uh, principles or health and safety concerns or resilience of, of supply. Whatever we think of that, right, and I obviously am not particularly positive about this trend, it is going to create incentives for governments to sit around the table, right, because obviously this is creating negative effects on the rest of the world on them. So I think those are all kind of signals for me where I say, okay, let's think a bit about the longer term, the longer term incentives for governments to cooperate, and I would argue it's not all bad news if we reflect a bit on what happened in the past. And I would also argue it's not all bad news if we look at what has actually been done in the WTO context, right? So the WTO is supposed to be a platform for negotiations. It's supposed to monitor implementation uh, and keep track of what governments are actually doing. And ultimately we have the dispute settlement mechanism. We have binding third party enforcement. So there's lots of things to be negative about. So Doha round failed. Uh, governments are not particularly good at notifying what they're doing. We have this huge crisis in dispute settlement with the demise of the appellate body, but there's also lots of positive signals, right? So we have the trade facilitation agreement. We have the information technology agreement. We have this, this, this new shift towards plurilateral discussions, right? And I fully take Deborah's point that these are not exactly going particularly fast and well. But I would, again, make the point that that's the case for almost anything that has to do with, with agreeing on rules of the road in areas of trade policy, and that's just part and parcel of the beast. So for me, the positive signal here is this shift towards plurilateral engagement, right? Because that implies that WTO members have realized that the consensus principle has been abused and essentially is a big part of the problem. So working that, that working practice is, is something that is now being clearly we visit it, and I would argue that's a positive sign. At the same time, there's great room uh, for improvement, right? And I would argue that for the WTO to stay salient, right, to stay in the game, what, what is really needed is to revitalize the function of the organization as a place where governments actually deliberate on the effects of policies and on the pros and cons of alternative means of cooperating. Right now, again, that's beginning to happen in a plurilateral environment. And I think the more that is done in Geneva, the better. So the initiatives that Deborah mentioned, which are happening in the Asia Pacific region, the digital economy <coughs> agreement, for example, that was driven by New Zealand and Singapore. I think we really need to, and I think this is certainly something that these countries are, are, are I think, willing to consider. And in fact, it's explicitly part of, of the New Zealand trade strategy is to bring those to, to the WTO. For these things to be meaningful, and this is the key challenge, it has to involve China. It has to involve the United States. It has to involve the European Union. So the big markets have to come together on this. And I think that is what has been missing to date in terms of bilateral engagements with China, in terms of trilateral engagements, which are directed at China, but China not being at the table. And that's another reason I would argue this, this plurilateral approach is really critical. And for that to work, I would also argue we need to become much more serious about analyzing the effects of these different policies to identify where is there a real need for cooperation, right? So in the digital arena, you can take that as an example. Where are there things that really need to be done at the domestic level? And where are there, what, what areas do you actually need to have agreements on particular rules to ensure interconnection, to ensure that data can flow, et cetera. Again, I'm not saying this is at all easy. It is not, it might very well all blow up. It's certainly gonna take a long time. But what I find missing today in these deliberations, insofar as there are deliberations, is they're not informed by enough analysis. It's not clear we're actually focusing on things that are of systemic importance. And it's not clear we actually know what the incidence is, who is going to gain, who has to give something up, where do we actually need to see changes in regulation. And I would go back to the past 
and say this is something that actually was done in the WTO in the 1980s, right? So in the in, in, in preparing for what ultimately became the Uruguay round, there was an intensive process of analysis, of deliberation, of trying to figure out what's in this for us, what are we actually doing, and what is the effects of what other countries are doing on this. And I think that's where the WTO today, I would argue, is failing, but I think it's also an area that we can very quickly kind of resuscitate with leadership. Leadership by a DG who takes this seriously, who will build a critical mass of countries that are interested in pursuing this route. Uh, we just did a survey of uh, WTO delegations and the trade community at large uh, a couple of months ago, asking what should be the priorities for the next DG and what are the issues confronting the WTO. And one of, not surprisingly, one of the big things that comes up is we need to get, get serious about monitoring what governments are doing on COVID-19. Uh, trade policy responses, including the massive subsidization that is ongoing and the effects of that on, on competitive uh, spillovers, the, the competitive spillover effects of that on other countries. But the number one priority that was also given as a, in, in terms of asking people to rank order what needs to be done was plurilateral engagement, right? So I think there is a real kind of critical mass of support for getting going on what needs to be done. And there is a lot that needs to be done in this regard. I actually have a PowerPoint, which we will post uh, on the conference site, which actually has some data uh, in terms of uh, how bad the situation is in terms of what governments are doing in terms of subsidy support measures and so forth. Um, but again, I would say what we need is we need to go beyond the, uh, the finger pointing of which there is too much, especially with respect to China, and to focus on, okay, let's actually get down nuts and bolts and work, which requires one, improving the data we have on the policies that are actually applied. And this is something where I would argue the WTO is really falling down on the job. Uh, the Global Trade Alert, which is an independent initiative which, which, which monitors the trade policies uh, by, um, by countries has you know, an, an order of magnitude more measures now, I think, than what we find being reported by the WTO. If you look at COVID-19 export restrictions and import liberalization measures, by my count, we have 58 notifications to the WTO by governments on those two items. If you look in the global trade alert, there are 600, right? So clearly there is a huge gap here. And I think that's where we need to start. We need to start by actually assessing what is happening, figuring out what the effects of that is, and then starting a discussion on how do we deal with the, with the spillover effects. And again, I would stress that this is an area where plurilateral cooperation is by necessity going to be the way forward, simply because we need the large players to be agreed to do this. And they should not accept kind of using the consensus principle to ensure that every country has to be part of this. I don't think that that's necessary. One exception, and this is my final point, uh, relates to dispute settlement. All right, so I would argue dis dispute settlement and where we are today on dispute settlement, where we don't have a functioning system. So the appellate body, as Peter uh, discussed, is out of the game for the moment. Um, and this is a big problem for the system because nobody is going to negotiate if you can't enforce agreements, right? So aside from whatever is going on now, if we want to get serious and move into this plurilateral path for cooperation on digital, on, on mapping out subsidies and dealing with subsidy spillovers, there needs to be a way to enforce whatever the agreement is that comes out of, of the, uh, into these plurilateral uh, agreements. Now, the stopgap that has been put in place by the European Union and that has been joined by, by China, which is this, this multi-party interim arbitration arrangement that Peter spoke of, is a plurilateral, right? But I think this is one instance where we don't want a plurilateral solution to a particular problem. We need everybody on board. And here, again, the solution is similar to what I've been talking about for other issue areas. We need to start by actually having a serious discussion as to what kind of a system do we want and how can we improve the system. And I find it very disappointing and unfortunate that over the last two years or so, all of the attention has been on the appellate body when, as Peter also mentioned, in fact, we, 
this is a two-part system and then the panel process is, is one that also could do with a lot of improvement. So I would argue, use the opportunity, you know, this is a crisis, it's an opportunity to rethink how can we actually make this peace settlement work uh, better. So Peter had some comments on, on the proposal that I have with Petros Mavroidis on uh, thinking about putting in place of only a first instance court. I would emphasize that's really kind of a thought experiment. Uh, that whole paper was written from the perspective of, is it possible to think about a system that doesn't have an appellate body? It doesn't take a normative stance on whether we should or should not have an appellate body. And I think the main point I would reiterate here is that we need to have a discussion on what should dispute settlement look like in the WTO and to date we haven't had it. So we've had this process of years of trying to defend the status quo, the appellate body, and that's meant we've lost. We've lost two years of potential deliberations in the WTO to actually focus on the substantive issues. Let me stop there. Thanks. Thank you very much, Bernard. Um, now we have around 15 minutes for an open discussion, but I, before, because I really feel that it would be very interesting to have your comments on what has been said from, from the different persons. But before that, uh, there are two questions which are, uh, we could connect to that discussion and that you could bring in with you, which is directed to all of you. And the first one uh, is from Christian Bluth. Are we focusing on the right areas to generate momentum for WTO reform? Is there a window of opportunity to make progress on subsidies and or carbon taxation? The other question comes from um, Eduardo Pedrosa and it will go to all panelists. What first steps would you suggest to clarify the national security exception? The G20, FTAs, question mark. But um, given, uh, given these questions, but also uh, suggestions that came from Bernard, it would be very interesting also to add the question uh, as a final remark from all of you, your suggestion for priority action when it comes uh, at this moment in time uh, to save the system. What is it if you would have to direct attention to one specific area and that we have discussed today, what would that be? So let's start with Peter. And this time I give, uh, I'll let you start Peter Draper in order to uh, discuss the issues we just raised and other things that have been said during the session. The floor is yours. You have a few minutes. Well, thanks, Jay. Um, well, I actually wanted to pick up on Bernard's reasons to be positive or optimistic. I think that is important. I, you know, I think the fundamental challenge that the WTO system <laughs> and global governance faces is the US-China contestation. When, when it comes down to it, I firmly believe that the US needs the WTO precisely to constrain China. That's what gives me hope. Now, what that constraining China looks like is a very open question. It involves all sorts of things. But I would say essential to that is meaningful reform of the uh, ASCM, the Agreement on Subsidies and Countervailing Measures. And I think there's a series of conversations to be had around that. That discussion gets to the heart of what is state capitalism. And like Bernard, I think there's been too much focus on China. I think there are different models of state capitalism out there. China just happens to be the biggest and it takes a particular form. But what makes the China issue so challenging, particularly for the US, is the open question in some ways whether China is a, you know, wants to change the system along its own design. That's the way the debate is being framed in, in Washington, particularly, I think, and they're not playing by the rules. That's what you often hear. The WTO is a market-oriented club, and the Chinese system cannot be accommodated within that. If that's right, and I, I don't believe it is, but if it is right, then the system, as Deborah said, does not have a future, in my view. I think we need to get beyond that framing and take a more pragmatic uh, approach to this. 
And what gives me optimism at the end of the day is, as I said, I think the US ultimately needs, needs China. Uh, as to how to get the national security conversation going, uh, or which forum I think is, is Eduardo's question, I think it needs to happen at multiple levels. There's certainly an Asia Pacific conversation to be had about that. Uh, and that's probably something that the PEC, which uh, Eduardo leads, could, could need itself, uh, for instance. And then a lot of these geopolitical tensions are taking place increasingly and centered on the Asia Pacific region. So for us to have that conversation that re in, in our region, I think could be a useful starting point. And APEC typically and the PEC behind this has seeded these kinds of ideas into regional conversations with an eye on the WTO. And I think that's the kind of role that, that PEC could play in this context. And clearly there needs to be a counterpart conversation in the WTO because this is not just about the Asia Pacific region. And it's not just about national security exceptions, as I've said, it's also about export restrictions, which is another very important set of conversations. I also think, as, a, as I've mentioned several times, that the G20 has a leadership role to play here. That, those conversations are much more difficult in the G20 context because there is some continuity in the G20 process, but once the leadership change, changes, the focus moves elsewhere, maybe there needs to be a more institutionalized process in the WTO, uh, sorry, in the G20 to address these issues as well. Introducing carbon taxes into the WTO right now. I'm not sure how that's going to go down. We've got enough to, to deal with. It's certainly an important conversation. It might just uh, add to the confusion. Um, it's a very inflammatory issue in, in many ways, but that doesn't mean the conversation shouldn't happen. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Peter. Uh, now I give the floor to you, Peter. Uh. Just a few very short comments uh, on uh, both the questions asked by the audience and, and, and uh, things said by my colleagues. Uh, first of all, on the choice between multilateral and plurilateral negotiations. Um, for me, plurilateral negotiations are fine, fine, as long as the results uh, are applied uh, on a most favored nation basis. Yeah? Um, uh, you only get into trouble when that is uh, not the case, I would say. Um, and I wonder whether if, uh, if we ever come to a result on the e-commerce uh, negotiations, um, whether uh, that will be such an agreement, a plurilateral agreement that can be applied on a most favored nation basis because there's enough of a critical mass. I mean, we've, we've had experience with that in the context of the information technology agreement. Um, secondly, um, with regard to national security, uh, I would not hold my breath for any successful negotiations, political negotiations on this, and then further clarifying that concept. But I would hope um, that uh, lots of attention is given and um, to the panel report in Russia, traffic and transit, which I think um, says about everything that we need to say uh, and can say um, about uh, a national security uh, exception, which we obviously need. Huh? Um, so I think I would, I would use that as a starting point and uh, not hope uh, for any political agreement on this. Um, for Deborah, um, I, I'm happy to be more on the part of, of, of Bernard in terms of uh, uh, cautious optimism. Um, uh, I would perhaps not say that the, half, the glass is half full, but it's at least a quarter full. Um, and um, the multilateral trading system has indeed been through crisis um, all along. Um, we've been spoiled over the last 25 years, I suppose. Um, it has had ups and downs, um, moments of multilateralism, moments of, of, of regionalism. Um, I, I was uh, intrigued by um, uh, your um, comments on, 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 on the e-commerce negotiations. And of course, I'm you're the specialist and I'm really an outsider now, but I understand that there's a 91 uh, page uh, stock take text, um, which obviously as an outsider I have not seen, um, but that seems to obviously with a lot of text between brackets and with different options, 
But that seems to indicate that there's at least a will uh, to move uh, forward. Um, and then finally, uh, with regard to um, uh, Bernard's uh, uh, intervention, um, yes, Bernard, I think we both agree um, that the discussion over the last year should not have focused, focused on the appellate body, but should have been, uh, how do you reform uh, the, the WTO dispute settlement system as a whole? Uh, and I would even throw in uh, not just the panel stage, but also the consultation space, uh, stage and uh, the implementation stage. There's a lot of rethinking uh, that could usefully be done. Uh, just one comment uh, on what you said that uh, nobody will seriously negotiate um, uh, if, if, if the agreements that would come out of these negotiations cannot be enforced. Um, as an international lawyer, uh, I would say uh, we people in the trade field, uh, we've been spoiled yeah? uh, because we did have a, a dispute settlement mechanism. Uh, uh, we have a system of enforcement, uh, much more than in many other fields of international law. Countries do um, uh, conclude agreements, uh, even if uh, they cannot be enforced um, um, in the most um, effective way. Uh, but of course, I mean, we're used to a different reality in the trade field. And um, so with that, I... Finish. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. So now I give the floor to... To Deborah, and um, um, just a few minutes left. Please, okay. Deborah. Thank, thank you very much. So, you know, again, I am an enthusiastic supporter of the multilateral system and have been for a long time. I want to see it succeed. I'm just suggesting that there are some real obstacles out there. And I will tell you, having dealt with companies in particular for quite some time, I have never not once, not ever, have I had a company that has come to me in the last, what, seven years or more and said anything about the WTO. They're just not interested. Their focus has moved on. The, they don't see the institution as responding to anything that is relevant to them. Now, of course, that's flawed. We can have a huge argument, and I do with my companies. You've missed the point. <laughs> you need the WTO. But the reality is that this is a system that doesn't seem to be functioning, and it doesn't seem to be relevant to the folks who surely should be paying attention to it. So what are we going to do? I mean, there's some fantastic questions that have come in and I wish I could answer, but let me just say, I would say one challenge for the WTO in my view is it needs to not negotiate. It needs to sit and think, but in a new way. So maybe the, the incoming DG will be able to spark a new kind of way of thinking. What is, how do we create an institution that is fit for purpose going forward? Rather than focusing on adjusting, a, changing the existing mechanisms, we start to think, what is it we want it to do now in 2020 and moving onward? And how do we get there? And maybe instead of trying to have, you know, legally binding anything at the moment, we spend time thinking about the broader objectives, the broader issues. And we draw on the experiences maybe of different settings, different regional agreements, different other settings to discuss what might be possible in the future, but rather than continuously bash on with negotiations that are you know, in different stages, uh, you know, focus more on bringing together that sort of shared set of interests and reminding people of what it is we're doing there in the first place before you move on and solve some of the real technical practical challenges, appellate body, various kinds of, uh, of agreements, et cetera, figuring out whether it should be a goods or a services talk, you know, where, where are we? So I think, you know, at this point, it would make sense to me to have a stock taking time. Now, I know that's been done in the past, but my suggestion is that you sort of set aside, now this is always hard for people, sort of set aside what you, what exists and try to think a bit creatively, where could we be, where should we be, what are the issues that we should put on the table? And there will be, I think, a lot of new ideas, and then trying to solve them is going to be a bit tricky. Uh, doesn't mean it can't be done, but I think that that Collective discussion of the issues, and maybe with, uh, I think Bernard is absolutely right, we should have more data around this, of what, what exactly are the costs and benefits of doing different kinds of things, that might spark more conversations, less stilted, formal presentations of what my government's policy has always been, and more creative, roll up our sleeves and figure out where are we going to go from here and why. And that makes sense to me. While that is going on at the global system, the other parts of the system in plurilateral somewhere else outside the WTO, alongside the WTO, in regional agreements, in bilaterals, whatever, that can try to sort of stabilize for the moment until we have a renewed consensus about where we want to go and how we plan to get there. 
So that, that would be my suggestion uh, for how we get, because at the end of the day, of course, we're gonna need a global trading system. Trade is global, it will always be global, I'm hoping. <laughs> so we're gonna need a system that helps us, but I just don't think that this is the moment in which we can expect big bang things out of the WTO. Instead, let's reflect on 2020 and beyond, pandemic has given everyone a wake up call. Great, let's seize the opportunity to really think hard about where are we, where do we wanna go and how do we get there and be creative. Thank you very much, Deborah, for those inspiring words. Um, I, you do have some questions that are directed to you and you see them and you make your, we don't have the time to take them here now, but you might be able later on to come back in a different way to these people. Uh, so now I will give the floor to Bernard, but you have a question from Joe Francois, who is also the, the co-host. And I would give it to you. And uh, then also for your final, have your final comment. And so this is the question, the appeal of parking plurilaterals in Geneva to my mind, yeah, was at least in part having access to a functional system for arbitration and dispute resolution. Without this, what is the argument for not bypassing Geneva completely on new issues? I recognize there are gap era examples of what might work, but I think Peter van Bosch's point on reducing uncertainty about the rules through consistent interpretation on agreed rules is important. So can we separate meaningful plur plur plurilateral progress from meaningful progress on some kind of enforcement and dispute mechanism. You take it on as you like, and then also some final comments from you. And I, the floor is yours. Okay, I think it, it depends a lot on the issue. So insofar as countries are negotiating things which need to be implemented by other countries, you need an enforcement mechanism and for plurilaterals to be brought to the WTO, you need a functioning dispute settlement mechanism, right? Otherwise there's no need and no reason to go to the WTO in the first place. I would also emphasize that there's lots of areas where the trade thinking, and here I agree completely with Deborah, and we've actually been doing quite a bit of research on this over the last few years, including with Chuck Sable at Columbia Law School, making the point that increasingly a lot of the issues that create spillovers or that require cooperation are regulatory in nature and that do not necessarily um, benefit from being linked to a market access type of mindset and a market access type of negotiation. So to a large extent, what we're talking about here, including in digital, is to try and identify what actually makes sense to do. What is good regulatory practice to achieve objectives that I have as a government and that, hey, once we talk a bit to other governments, it turns out, well, those other governments actually have exactly the same objectives, right? So I think there is a huge area where kind of cooperation and dialogue on trying to figure out what is good practice makes a lot of sense. And I, I would argue, and I've written papers on this, that trying to throw all this stuff into a trade agreement may not make any sense at all. It might create all kinds of antibodies, both on the part of the regulators, on the part of consumers, who start worrying about, oh my God, these guys who only want to sell cheese are not going to be in charge of what is really a complex and important regulatory agenda. So I think we really, part of the thinking, and I agree completely with Deborah on this, part of the thinking that needs to be done is to disentangle these things, right? And to try and have a discussion as to what can we learn from examples of international regulatory cooperation which exists, right? Sectoral regulators, lots of sectoral regulators do this across the world in their particular area and ask the question, where does it make sense to link that to trade? Because there's an important trade dimension. Where might you need some trade link for enforcement? And where, please people, for God's sake, let's not go down the trade route because that's gonna blow up the cooperation we need to do. And we're not gonna be focusing on the right questions, which is what makes for good regulation? How do we learn from each other? How do we update our data sets in terms of figuring out what the effects are, et cetera. So I think, again, that goes back to a real need to kind of not automatically jump into the negotiating mindset. And again, I would reiterate, I agree completely with that, and I would argue that's one of the big, big problems with the way the EU, the US and Japan have approached the subsidies issue with China. It's all about, let's sit together somewhere amongst ourselves and try and define rules, which we will then somehow enforce against China. 
And I think if you talk to Chinese policymakers, they will share a lot of the objectives in terms of let's actually try and figure out if it makes sense what we're doing, how can we do this better? So I have a much more positive, constructive dialogue on, on, on kind of trying to figure out what makes for good practice and in the process identify where we are creating large negative spillovers that do need to be addressed somehow and how do we do that in an efficient way. So I think that's really where we want to go. So Deborah has been much more articulate, I think, on this than I have, but I am completely on the same page. And I very much hope the next DG will have both that mindset and the willingness to, you know, get beyond this member driven and allow consensus to reign and actually have these discussions in Geneva, as opposed to having them elsewhere. Thanks. Thank you so much, all, all of you. And uh, I think this has been a very powerful discussion, uh, having been in the field for some time. And I also think that it gives some hope for the future in if there are some routes which should be followed. And I think the call for more dialogue uh, and more evidence-based dialogue and uh, objective analysis of facts, which has been called on also here by several of you, is terribly important. And uh, this type of conference is, is so important in that sense and uh, to bring the, these kind of thoughts and, and, and actions further. So thank you for having me on with you and thank you everyone who's been listening and uh, look forward to the next session. Thank you. Let me just add one thing. So I think all the questions, uh, including those that weren't addressed, we'll keep track of all of them and parcel them around. So maybe some of these things can be addressed bilaterally so that um, you, know, you do get answers to questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, see you soon. Bye-bye.